What's your name? Christoph, Christoph Schumann. And what do you do? Oh, I'm one of the founders and chairman of Lion. And Lion is a community of like people who just like to do open source AI stuff. What motivated you to start Lion? So I originally saw the DALI 1 paper and I was blown away and I was thinking, okay, how could we get a data set to replicate such a model? And I was at this time on the Eleuther AI Discord server and I was talking to some people and they told me, yeah, someone should do it. Maybe I'll do it later. And I was thinking, oh yeah, ho hopefully they will do it. But they didn't. They had other projects going on. And then I simply began to do it myself, being a high school physics and computer science teacher on Colab. And um, yeah, like someone else joined me who later turned out to be a 15 years old high school student at the time from England. And we, we uh, got a few million image text pairs from Common Crawl, which is like basically something like a huge public dump of um, HTML from several websites. And we used the existing clip model to filter out which images fit to which uh, alternative text that they carry with them. And after a few weeks, we had like three million image text pairs. And we thought, oh, this was easy. And then more and more people joined and just gave us access to virtual machines, to GPUs, and it grew. And after a few months, we had 413 million filtered uh, image text pairs. It's huge. And then like, uh, like I have a background in um, supervising alternative education private schools. And I have been making a documentary about this in the past and I know a lot about nonprofit in this area. So I thought, okay, let's register a nonprofit, not big, just something small where we can open a bank account and get then some funding, maybe not to pay people, but to cover costs. And then, yeah, we, we did it and we got like an offer from Hugging Face to support us to cover some compute costs. And um, then a few months later, we had 5.8 billion image text pairs, which is by far the, the, the biggest publicly available. And then more and more compute came to us, like people popped up, like Imad Mostak, the, the um, CEO of Stability, he came to our server and he said, oh, I'm a former hedge fund manager, I want to give free GPUs for open source researchers. And I was thinking, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we know, we all know the story from there, right? You're your big name now, Lion, everybody knows you. Yeah, and it's great, but it's not about Lion, it's about grassroots open source AI, because I'm still like a high school teacher by profession. I have been getting some, some offers. I declined because I have a tenure. Uh, Germany is crazy, they give tenure to high school teachers. And so I thought it's much better for us to stay independent and to rely completely on volunteer work because by doing this, we don't open up this box of Pandora because we have some people working at us who are Google engineers or whatever, like working at Facebook or whatever. And if we would have to pay them, we would have to pay them ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month. But now they are working like part time for free for our projects because they believe in this dream of truly open AI, like making it open source, uh, uh, available as open source. And this is a huge community and everyone just contributes as much as he wants. Great, yeah, so open source AI. Um, I'm really interested in learning your thoughts on the interaction between open source AI and possible negative consequences from people using AI, like, mis like misuse type things. Yeah, I mean like, this might sound a little bit cheesy, but like we had been so many discussions about this. And for example, you can take a knife and you can uh, make delicious food with it. You can take a knife, you can do very bad things like killing people with knives or whatever. And we still can buy knives. And most people, like 99.99999% do nice things with it. The difference is that AI in the future is much more scalable. So it could be that in the future, AI could be used to do far worse things than just me with a knife. But the thing is, like, um, the thing is, if you have like a huge network of AIs, then you could have something like an antivirus system where you have agents that make sure that like if 99% behave good and 1% behaves bad, the other 1% gets somehow uh, kicked out of like the, the society of AIs or whatever. 
And the thing is, if, for example, people right now take a text-to-image model and do, I don't know, something that uh, insults me or someone else, then this is bad. But first, they could already do it with Photoshop right now or with a pen if they would really try hard. <laughs> or uh, if AI empowers them to do so, then it's better they do it right now and cause a public discourse about the potential implications of an AI, then like, imagine the, uh, we would keep it closed and other companies like Google and Facebook would keep it closed. And then one day um, the Russians or the Chinese like, uh, or like some, some states that are a little bit like where it's not really obvious like what their intentions are, they would re just release a very powerful model. And no one in the broad society would know about it. And every, like the normal people, like the, the, like the people who go to my school, like the, the decent, intelligent people, but they have no idea about AI. They would be completely oblivious. They would be completely shocked. And the consequences of misuse by bad actors like Russia or whatever um, would be much worse than if we have right now these models open and everyone can talk about it. Every, journalists can bring it into the um, consciousness of like... Um, uh, politicians, decision makers, and then we can see as a society all together how we will deal with it. And, and this is like, so open sourcing AI, you can say AI in the, in the future will be something like uh, um, the ability to, to do cool stuff, to solve problems, okay? Like maybe not all problems can be solved with AI, but in a world that increasingly gets computerized and digitized, it will be um, increasingly converge to like AI equals the ability to solve problems. Not completely, but a lot of problems. And if you are asking, should we open source the ability to solve problems or should we like make it exclusively available to nation states and big companies? And if, if you think about this, imagine a future where the ability to solve problems exclusively belongs to big companies or nation states and it's obvious to almost anyone that this is not a good future. I mean we want legal systems that are reliable, that take care of us, that protect us and our rights and we want companies that flourish and that give employment and pay taxes and so we want this. But this is in my opinion completely independent from the question should the people who work in these companies, like, sh should they have also access to these superpowers? So, like, in, in my uh, imagination, it's more like, imagine a future where nation states and companies are flourishing and safe and pay taxes and everything's fine because the people who work there and the citizens, they have these abilities to do cool stuff that they wouldn't have to. So you mentioned something at the beginning about uh, misuse. So I think it was, the example was something like 99% of people using AI systems are doing good things and like 1% are doing bad things. And the idea is that you'd somehow kick out the 1%. So I, I think this is like a nice idea, but my, my uncertainty in the question, I guess, is like we're in a world right now where we are deploying generative models more and more to people. We don't have such a system of, you know, kicking people out or preventing misuse right now, um, like the 1%, right? So like, like, you know, from the perspective of somebody working at Lion, how do you think about, you know, dealing with, for example, misinformation or like increased bias now? So I have been thinking a lot about this. I have been contacted by some political advisors and like to talk to them. So my opinion is like, let's be honest. No matter, even if you would shut down Lyon, and even if you would probably shut down some academic research labs working on open source, yeah, like a few years from now, three, four, five years, we will be in a position where people can easily generate all kinds of fake content that looks so good, like images, music songs, videos, that like a, a normal person cannot tell the difference to like an actual camera recording or whatever and this will happen sooner or later and in such a world like this idea of like um, prohibiting it would result in a complete surveillance state because like you cannot like monitor everyone who is doing at home on his or her GPU what image or so so like 
20, 30 years ago, people maybe thought, oh no, the internet is so mean, everyone can look up like uh, mean p pictures or uh, uh, disgusting pictures on Google. And you can do it right now, right? So um, for me, being a high school teacher, of course, it's not allowed that people do this, but I was like in an inner city school where like many people with uh, like low income kids were. And sometimes like they just pulled out the smartphones with their mobile plans and got really ugly pictures. Okay. So they, they, they can do it. Like even like so this, this is something that's already there. And in the future, no matter if you shut down all the open source institutions or not, this will be a possibility. You cannot monitor everything one because they are suspects of eventually belong to the one percent does that who does evil stuff. So there will be a flood of fake media and disinformation. And the solution will not be by trying to shut down all the fake media. The solution will be by putting higher value to um, trustworthiness. And I can imagine, this is just an idea, but my imagination is that there will be something like an international blockchain or whatever, like a, like a, a notebook where people can note down that they uh, consider an individual or a newspaper as trustworthy. And let's say we have something like an U.S. centralized uh, state authority that certifies trustworthiness to journalists or to content creators on YouTube like you are. And there will be maybe such an agency for Germany and for France and for Russia and maybe even for North Korea, even though no one would like to watch it. But um, it could be. And then later when you're using YouTube and you want to see something about the Ukraine war, then you can filter out and say, I want only those people who had been uh, checked for trustworthiness, who had been certified by this American institution during the last six months. Or you could say, okay, now I've watched all the uh, American YouTubers. Now I want to see all the r from the Russian side, where the Russian authorities certified them to get in like, just not because I believe them, but just I'm, I'm curious. I want to see what they are saying and believing. And then I can be sure that at least within certain information bubbles, these people are considered trustworthy and I can build myself an opinion. Because if I would not have like an, an, an instrument to give me, uh, to tell me who I can trust, then I would be completely lost. And it's already almost there. Like I, I, I cannot believe every YouTuber, every bullshit. So I have to like to look up who is this guy? What did he do before? How many followers does he have? And it's already hard, but it will be much harder in five years, no matter if there will be open source AI or not open source AI. But I think it's good to talk about this openly and frankly. And I can really imagine like maybe 10 years from now, really rich people going to a retreat without Wi-Fi, listening to real music, watching like real art from real artists. And this will give even more value to those things that are provably made by humans because cheap will be like the, the cheap thing that everyone does will be just taking your smartphone and like click yeah make me sound like maria callas yeah totally yeah i think it's a very interesting idea so just for the record i'm a machine learning phd student not a youtuber um so we, we, we've talked a lot about you know possible harms from supervised learning systems um one thing i'm interested in getting your thoughts on is do you think about the harms from reinforcement learning systems so like agents that are trained to achieve some goal or maximize some return over a long time horizon yeah, this is something um, in general with machine learning. We should be cautious a little bit because it's the same as with humans. Yeah, if I don't know someone and I give him like a task where he uh, has a, a huge responsibility, like with huge power comes huge res responsibility, I should at first observe him a little bit, test him a little bit, get an opinion, a good feeling, or maybe some protocol to test his abilities. And the same um, applies to reinforcement learning even more because we know that this technology is still in an early phase of like being reliable. So if I, for example, train a summarization model like to summarize f from human feedback, like OpenAI did a few days ago, and I want to deploy it like on a website where no many business people will use it, of course I should do like a proper evaluation of its reliability or I should put a big disclaimer Please don't use only with caution, always double check. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's totally the case. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I guess one additional worry is there might be cases in which we test and test, but it turns out that the systems we're building just happen to misgeneralize out of distribution. Like we deploy it and something bad happens. Um, so I think one perspective is, you know, we kind of want to be in a situation where that, that bad thing doesn't happen in the first place, whether because one, we've fund we fundamentally gain some understanding about how our systems work, or two, you know, we um, just decide not to deploy such systems in the first place. So I guess I'm wondering what, what your stance is on this with respect to, you know, sy systems over which we have a lot of uncertainty. Um, like, should we be slowing things down and like trying to characterize the properties of s such systems more, or should we be doing something else? I think we should not slow things down. I think we should improve the speed of which the general public gets educated about it. Because like the most important, the most dangerous thing here is now like having ordinary people downloading an image generation tool or maybe a language model or whatever and deploying it without knowing about the, 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 the uh, borders of the capabilities, the, the limits. So people need to be aware that AI is growing exponentially or maybe like I, you can debate about like whether the true capability it's not growing exponentially but it's growing fast and the people have to know that this is a thing not not you not me not the people who watch this channel but all the other people out there and once they understand okay this is cool but i cannot like uh, yet let my little child use it without parental guidance or so then it's already good and then like you know if we have a chatbot. Imagine we have like a GPT-like super chatbot that um, people could deploy for call centers. It would be nice to have this for art, maybe as a uh, creative writing assistant. I can imagine this already like being useful for some people, but I can really not imagine to be this deployed in a call center for huge banks or so. So like if you deploy it at first in a creative content or like in a, in a content where people are allowed to make um, mistakes and learn then maybe after five years or three years people will think ah oh, okay the failure rate gets really low and we have better tools to understand it so the question was you know we've talked a lot about misuse and ai systems possibly acting out of control do you have any thoughts on ai systems that could cause harms in a sort of more diffuse way at the collective level so say with labor automation if we automate a lot of labor um you know that people in the middle class do this seems like this destroys a lot of um, your know, social mobility right so yeah what are your thoughts on this yeah i actually have lots of thoughts on this and i think the biggest threat in this context is that no matter if there are certain AI models right now, the change of our society and the change of the labor market will be huge. And I say really huge and most people cannot anticipate this, especially those people who have nothing to do with computers. And this will change the world completely independent of certain models or companies. And if you're in an environment like a labor environment, education environment that quickly changes, like imagine you have like a continuum and you have two extremes. On the one hand, people like who um, embrace change or have an open mindset, like they learn and they see change or failures as, as an opportunity to learn something, to expand their, their skill set. And on the other end, as a continuum, this is extreme. Yeah? You have, we have people like who are very conservative and like they l love if st things stay the same as they always had been. And they hate change and they feel actually threatened by change because they think, oh, I have to learn something new. I thought I was done with learning after school. So, and if in, in reality people are between these two extremes and the same person can be in one context be a little bit more here and in another context be, be a little bit more here but in general for example if you consider someone who is more here on the open-minded side he would say okay yeah my job is changing i need to learn new skills maybe i will learn about ai maybe i will learn about this or that internet marketing i don't know whatever and you have this other person who says oh no my job is threatened the machines are stealing my jobs the big companies are stealing my jobs. I refuse this. And then he would try to refuse it to ignore it. 
And then later maybe he will like say, oh, these people are really stealing my jobs. They are bad. We have to uh, destroy them. We have to sue them. And there are these tensions. On the other hand, you have this divide with the people who have lots of opportunities. And there you have for many, many people who are actually scared and then become angry because they are so scared. And this is very bad. And this is not about like a certain company or a certain country. This is a global phenomenon. And these people here, they will look for certainty for like people who make clear promises, who say, this is the reason we're going to bring back the good old time. And of course, this is a lie because the compute, the, the, the society is so for changing so fast because we like just look back 20 years like we now have uh, the internet we have twitter we have all these debates about donald trump being on twitter not being on twitter we have like uh, facebook where you can meet all your uh, school friends elementary school friends and you can connect with them like 20 years ago it wasn't possible and this excel will accelerate even far more than people can imagine right now and this will lead to this these extremes where people here who are scared and are afraid of change they will vote people with simple solutions who promise that everything will be like in the good old days regardless of the country or the party or whether communist or or whatever like conservative it doesn't matter and this is a really scary thing i am not so much scared of certain ai systems even though they can have dangers and should be like uh, closely hand carefully handled i'm much more scared by the fact that we have this divide in societies between open-minded people and people who hate change and who have feel threatened by change and this is a challenge that we have to meet but i think we cannot solve this problem by saying okay we will keep the change uh, closed we will keep the uh, image text image models away we will pretend as if this, there was nothing like this because the behind the scenes like uh, nation states and uh, companies will de keep developing this and these models will leak out even if they try to, to uh, hold them back. So this development, this tsunami, this information, this information, AI tsunami that's rolling up on our societies, it is coming and no single state or no single company will be able to hold it or to, to prevent it, to, to, to keep it, to stop it from, from approaching. The thing is, do we close our eyes and say, no, there is no tsunami, we are regular again everything, trust us, we are trustworthy uh, corporate people and politicians. Or do we say, it is there, let's try to make the best out of it and let's take openly about it, let's, let's probe this tsunami and let's talk about it in, a fr like in, a, in an honest way, Let, let's be honest. Let's be honest of it. it, it will be there and like there will be jobs in 10 years that are not there anymore. And it's not about me or Lion or, or, or any company on the world. So we are not even a company, so, but like it's, it, it's not about us. It's about the truth that this tsunami is coming and we should educate the people about it. So what do we do beyond education? It's the art of it. Yes. So the truth is, um, I don't know the exact solution. I could promise you. I could tell you, yeah, I know exactly. This, let's do this and everything will be like in the good old ways. So or everything will be all right. This would be a lie. <laughs> and I think if it would be someone else and he would tell you the solution, this also would be a lie. Because everything is very complex. But I think what, I, imagine again, imagine a future where the superpowers we will get, we can get from AI, will be exclusively limited to nation states and big corporations and maybe a few agencies or whatever. And then imagine a future where these superpowers made by AI will be accessible to everyone and everyone can I, make an opinion out of it. And we have a network of many, many people and organizations and small companies, big companies, private people, journalists, countries, and they all together can try to organize th this new system. If you asked me which I would choose, it would be pretty easy for me to make a choice. What do you think about existential risk? Yeah, I mean, it had been there when I was born in uh, 1982. And 
Now, with the Ukraine war, it came a little bit back in, into my mind that, that, in theory, even though I don't think it's likely, but there could be the nuclear war, for example. And I think it also like could happen with AI, or uh, actually, I think far more dangerous is uh, the, uh, bioweapons with things like CRISPR. So like we have seen this with Corona and no one took it seriously. And I mean, then only needs to be one mad scientist somewhere in a lab and release something that is as um, contagious as Corona, but uh, far more deadly. And this would change everything completely. Or like imagine like, like a, a certain leader in Asia deciding to attack a small country that is important uh, for uh, the semiconductors. This would be very bad for the whole economy of the whole world. And therefore, I hope that these people who can make the decisions are reasonable and don't do it. But um, these are true threats. And AI, of course, can also be such a threat. But it's the same like, I mean, there will always be threats. And the thing is about if we have a grim view of human nature and of life, like grimmer than it actually is by thinking, oh my God, there's 1% chance that people will take the knife and kill someone with a knife. I mean, then your heart and your mind is filled with scare, with, 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 with fear. And fear is not a good teacher. I mean, f fear is good if you can recognize it and use it as a basis to elaborate on it like we're doing. It's good. It, it informs us. It mo motivates us. But if it takes control and it narrows down your, your, your mind and you fall back onto the, on these old rigid behaviors that you had been back in the good old days when you were in, in another like fight or flight situation like this, then it's a really bad like source of information. So therefore, like, let's be afraid. Let's Let's say, yeah, there's a chance that there's an existential risk by AI as well as by bioweapons and other technologies and mad uh, politicians. There's a threat. But let's also remember all the positive aspects that is, uh, of it. Like, so there, there was this uh, tweet by Joshua Bach who told that uh, there should be like a Team Red with the release of every AI model that where people would evaluate what are the dangers of releasing this AI model? But it's the same, there should be a team green and say, what are the dangers of not releasing it? I mean, like, by not releasing it, we could prevent, like, lots of progress and wonderful art or, like, maybe people who can, like, uh, discover aspects of their soul because they use AI as a mirror to their own uh, conscious states. So, like, all these wonderful aspects could be prevented and by not preventing this this would also be a loss for uh, the possible future so i mean in general i'm a pretty much an optimist but i'm not a naive optimist i know there are fears i know bad things can happen bad things have been happening to my life even though my my life uh, i have been pretty privileged and i'm very happy in my life but the more i experienced bad situations in my life dire situation the more I tried to focus on the thought, how can I make something happen, something new, so that in the future things will get better again. And I think if we have this inner attitude, like realistic optimism, like having this image, maybe having a little bit of a romanticized image of the future, but realistically making plan how to get from here to there, this is the best attitude and not saying, oh my God, there could be a something bad happening and therefore we have to kill all the positive aspects of Team Green, like of the of the of the of these dreams. Like we should be bold enough to dream about an utopian future and not forget about the potential threats by a dystopian future. And then we should sit down calmly and try to make a solid plan with several alternatives to get to the utopia or at least close yeah i really like what you said there about fear about you know having it being an important signal for directing your work when having it consume like everything we're doing um yeah so, so i guess one question is like you know um yeah existential risk might be real also the benefits from ai might be real and important um it seems like it's very hard to like balance these things right so i'm wondering like how do you personally think about balancing you know like the possible downsides of ai from like possible upsides and how that informs you know you work at lion and um yeah 
I don't even work at Lyon. It's my hobby. I'm a computer science teacher. And for some reasons, uh, CEOs of tech companies ping PM me on Discord and Slack. And I, I just do it because I believe it. I, I don't make any money with this. And the thing is, I'm doing this. I even reject offers for jobs because I want, I, I believe that it's better to have open source abilities to, to solve problems, like open source AI equals abilities to solve problems in the future. I w really want this because I personally think that AI will become really, really powerful maybe within 10, 20 years when my kids will be grown up. And I want to influence it in a positive way. And positive, I do not mean, I'm not trying to f prevent all the threats because I think no one really can. I'm trying to create opportunities for people to do wonderful stuff with this and then maybe find solutions for the problems that we cannot even think about right now. Great. Well, one last question. If you had one thing to say right now to yourself, uh, you know, when you were 10 years old, what would it be? Oh, I've recently watched Back to the Future with my older son who's 10. And I feel like if you change the past, maybe, maybe there's a reason all the bad things you had been encountering in life, all the hardships, they, they made me the person I am now. Therefore, I would say nothing. I would just say thank you, life, for giving me all the hardships I could learn from and all the wonderful moments I can savor in uh, retrospective. All right, thank you very much. This is Christoph from Lyon.